Hello, class 2SA from outside. We're gonna do some Charlotte's Web from outside today. Our home audience is very busy eating. Scouty's having a picnic. Scouty, say hi. Hi. Sawyer. Hi. And Scarlett. And they're ready for the next few chapters of Charlotte's Web. So where we left off, um, Mr. Zuckerman has decided to have Wilbur go to the fair and enter a contest. And they're kind of feeling like if Wilbur wins, like a blue ribbon at the fair, that he won't be eaten at Christmas time. So here's hoping. Um, here's chapter 16, which is called Off to the Fair. The night before the county fair, everybody went to bed early. Fern and Avery were in bed by eight. Avery lay dreaming that the Ferris wheel had stopped and that he was in the top car. Fern lay dreaming that she was getting sick in the swings. Lurvy was in bed by 8.30. He lay dreaming that he was throwing baseballs at a cloth cat and winning a genuine Navajo blanket. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were in bed by nine. Mrs. Zuckerman lay dreaming about a deep freeze unit. Mr. Zuckerman lay dreaming about Wilbur. He dreamt that Wilbur had grown until he was 116 feet long and 92 feet high and that he had won all the prizes at the fair and was covered with blue ribbons and even had a blue ribbon tied to the end of his tail. And here's a picture of giant Wilbur in his dream. Oh my God. Down in the barn cellar, the animals too, um, sorry, the animals too went to sleep early, all except Charlotte. Tomorrow would be fair day. Every creature planned to get up early to see Wilbur off on his great adventure. When morning came, everybody got up at daylight. The day was hot. Up the road at the Arabelle's house, Fern lugged a pail of hot water to her room and took a sponge bath. Then she put on her prettiest dress because she knew she would see boys at the fair. Mrs. Arabelle scrubbed the back of Avery's neck and wet his hair and parted it and brushed it down hard till it stuck to the top of his head. All but about six hairs that stood straight up. Avery put on clean underwear, clean blue jeans, and a clean shirt. Mr. Arabelle dressed, ate breakfast, and then went out and polished his truck. He had offered to drive everybody to the fair, including Wilbur. Bright and early, Lurvy put clean straw in Wilbur's crate and lifted it into the pig pen. The crate was green. In gold letters, it said Zuckerman's famous pig. Charlotte had her web looking fine for the occasion. Daddy. Wilbur ate his breakfast slowly. He tried to look radiant without getting food in his ears. In the kitchen, Mrs. Zuckerman suddenly made an announcement. Homer, she said to her husband, I am going to give that pig a buttermilk bath. A what, said Mr. Zuckerman? A buttermilk bath. My grandmother used to bathe her pig with buttermilk when it got dirty. I just remembered. Wilbur's not dirty, said Mr. Zuckerman proudly. He's filthy behind the ears, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Every time Lurvy slops him, the food runs down around the ears. Then it dries and forms a crust. He also has a smudge on one side where he lays in the manure. He lays in clean straw, corrected Mr. Zuckerman. Well, he's dirty and he's going to have a bath. Edith, uh, sorry, Mr. Zuckerman sat down weakly and ate a donut. His wife went to the woodshed. When she returned, she wore rubber boots and an old raincoat and she carried a bucket of buttermilk and a small wooden paddle. Edith, you're crazy, mumbled Zuckerman, but she paid no attention to him. Together, they walked to the pig pen. Mrs. Zuckerman wasted no time. She climbed in with Wilbur and went to work. Dipping her paddle in the buttermilk, she rubbed him all over. The geese gathered around to see the fun. Marcus. And so did the sheep and the lambs. Even Templeton poked his head out cautiously to watch Wilbur get a buttermilk bath. And here's Wilbur getting his buttermilk bath. Looks fun. Yeah, it does look kind of fun. Charlotte got so interested, she lowered herself on a drag line so she could see better. Wilbur stood still and closed his eyes. He could feel the buttermilk trickling down his sides. He opened his mouth and some buttermilk ran in. It was delicious. He felt radiant and happy. When Mrs. Zuckerman got through and rubbed him dry, he was the cleanest, prettiest pig you ever saw. He was pure white, pink around the ears and snout, and smooth as silk. The Zuckermans went up to change into their best clothes. Lurvy went to shave and put on his plaid shirt and his purple necktie. The animals were left to themselves in the barn. The seven goslings paraded around and around their mother. Please, please, please take us to the fair, begged a gosling. Then all seven began teasing to go. Please, 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 please. They made quite a racket. Children, snapped the goose, were staying quietly, quietly, quietly at home. Only Wilbur, Ilbur, Ilbur is going to the fair. 
Just then, Charlotte interrupted. I shall go too, she said softly. I have decided to go with Wilbur. He may need me. We can't tell what may happen at the fairgrounds. Somebody's got to go along who knows how to write. And I think Templeton had better come too. I might need somebody to run errands and do general work. I'm staying right here, grumbled the rat. I haven't the slightest interest in fairs. That's because you've never been to one, remarked the old sheep. A fair is a rat's paradise. Everybody spills food at a fair. A rat can creep out late at night and have a feast. In the horse barn, you'll find oats that the trotters and pacers have spilled. In the trampled grass of the infield, you'll find old discarded lunch boxes containing the foul remains of peanut butter sandwiches, hard boiled eggs, cracker crumbs, bits of donuts, and particles of cheese. In the hard packed dirt of the midway after the glaring lights are out and the people have gone home to bed, you'll find a veritable treasure of popcorn fragments, frozen custard dribblings, candied apples abandoned by tired children, sugar fluff crystals, salted almonds, popsicles, partially gnawed ice cream cones, and the wooden sticks of lollipops. Everywhere is loot for a rat, in tents and booths and haylofts. Why a fair has enough disgusting leftover food to satisfy a whole army of rats. Templeton's eyes were blazing. Is this true, he asked? Is this appetizing yarn of yours true? I like high living and what you say tempts me. It is true, said the old sheep. Go to the fair, Templeton. You will find that the conditions at a fair will surpass your wildest dreams. Buckets with sour mash sticking to them, tin cans containing particles of tuna fish, greasy paper bags stuffed with rotten. That's enough, cried Templeton. Don't tell me any more. I'm going. Good, said Charlotte, winking at the old sheep. Now then, there is no time to be lost. Wilbur will soon be put into the crate. Templeton and I must get into the crate right now and hide ourselves. The rat didn't waste a minute. He scampered over to the crate, crawled between the slats, and pulled straw up over him so he was hidden from sight. All right, said Charlotte, I'm next. She sailed into the air, let out a drag line, and dropped gently to the ground. Then she climbed the side of the crate and hid herself inside a knot hole in the top board. The old sheep nodded. What a cargo, she said. That sign ought to say Zuckerman's famous pig and two stowaways. Look out, the people are coming, umming, umming, shouted the gander. Cheese it, cheese it, cheese it. The big truck with Mr. Arabelle at the wheel backed slowly toward the barnyard. Lurvy and Mr. Zuckerman walked alongside. Fern and Avery were standing in the body of the truck, hanging on to the sideboards. Listen to me, whispered the old sheep to Wilbur. When they open the crate and try to put you in, struggle. Don't go without a tussle. Pigs always resist when they're being loaded. If I struggle, I'll get dirty, said Wilbur. Never mind that, do as I say, struggle. If you were to walk into the crate without resisting, Zuckerman might think you were bewitched. He'd be scared to go to the fair. Templeton poked his head up through the straw. Struggle if you must, said he, but kindly remember that I'm hiding down here in this crate and I don't wanna be stepped on or kicked in the face or pummeled or crushed in any way or squashed or buffeted about or bruised or lacerated or scarred or biffed. Just watch what you're doing, Mr. Radiant, when they get to shoving you in. Be quiet, Templeton, said the sheep. Pull in your head. They're coming. Look radiant, Wilbur. Lay low, Charlotte. Talk it up, geese. The truck backed slowly to the pig pen and stopped. Mr. Arabelle cut the motor, got out, walked around to the rear, and lowered the tailgate. The geese cheered. Mrs. Arabelle got out of the truck. Fern and Avery jumped to the ground. Mrs. Zuckerman came walking down from the house. Everybody lined up at the fence and stood for a moment, admiring Wilbur and the beautiful green crate. Nobody realized that the crate already contained a rat and a spider. That's some pig, said Mrs. Arabelle. He's terrific, said Lurvy. He's very radiant, said Fern, remembering the day he was born. Well, said Mrs. Zuckerman, he's clean anyway. The buttermilk certainly helped. Mr. Arabelle studied Wilbur carefully. Yes, he's a wonderful pig, he said. It's hard to believe that he was the runt of the litter. You'll get some extra good ham and bacon, Homer, when it comes time to kill that pig. Wilbur heard these words and his heart almost stopped. I think I'm going to faint, he whispered to the old sheep who was watching. Kneel down, whispered the old sheep. Let the blood rush to your head. Wilbur sank to his knees, all radiance gone. His eyes closed. Look, screamed Fern, he's fading away. Hey, watch me, yelled Avery, crawling on all fours into the crate. I'm a pig, I'm a pig. Avery's foot touched Templeton under the straw. What a mess, thought the rat. What fantastic creatures boys are. Why did I let myself in for this? The geese saw Avery in the crate and cheered. Avery, you get out of that crate this instant, commanded his mother. What do you think you are? I'm a pig, cried Avery, tossing handfuls of straw into the air. Oink, oink, oink. The truck is rolling away, Papa, said Fern. The truck, with no one at the wheel, had started to run downhill. Mr. Arabelle dashed to the driver's seat and pulled on the emergency brake. The truck stopped. The geese cheered. Charlotte crouched and made herself as small as possible in the knot hole so Avery wouldn't see her. Come out at once, cried Mrs. Arabelle. 
Avery crawled out of the crate on hands and knees, making faces at Wilbur. Wilbur fainted away. The pig is passed out, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Throw water on him. Throw buttermilk, suggested Avery. The geese cheered. Lurvy ran for a pail of water. Fern climbed into the pen and knelt by Wilbur's side. It's sunstroke, said Zuckerman. The heat is too much for him. Maybe he's dead, said Avery. Come out of that pig pen immediately, cried Mrs. Arabelle. Avery obeyed his mother and climbed into the back of the truck so he could see better. Lurvy returned with cold water and dashed it on Wilbur. Throw some on me, cried Avery. I'm hot too. Oh, keep quiet, cried Fern. Keep quiet. Her eyes were brimming with tears. Wilbur, feeling the cold water, came too. He rose slowly to his feet while the geese cheered. And here's the picture of Lurvy throwing water. They don't make right? No. You'll see. He's up, said Mr. Arabelle. I guess there's nothing wrong with him. I'm hungry, said Avery. I want a candied apple. Wilbur's all right now, said Fern. We can start. I want to take a ride in the Ferris wheel. Mr. Zuckerman and Mr. Arabelle and Lurvy grabbed the pig and pushed him head first toward the crate. Wilbur began to struggle. The harder the men pushed, the harder he held back. Avery jumped down and joined the men. Wilbur kicked and thrashed and grunted. Nothing wrong with this pig, said Mr. Zuckerman cheerfully, pressing his knee above Wilbur's behind. All together now, boys, shove. With a final heave, they jammed him into the crate. The geese cheered. Lurvy nailed some boards across the end so Wilbur couldn't back out. Then, using all their strength, the men picked up the crate and heaved it aboard the truck. They did not know that under the straw was a rat, and inside a knot hole was a big gray spider. They only saw a pig. Everybody in, called Mr. Arabelle. He started the motor. The ladies climbed in beside him. Mr. Zuckerman and Lurvy and Fern and Avery rode in back, hanging onto the sideboards. The truck began to move ahead. The geese cheered. The children answered their cheer, and away went everybody to the fair. Okay, we're going to keep going. The next chapter is called Uncle. When they pulled into the fairgrounds, they could hear music and see the Ferris wheel turning in the sky. They could smell the dust of the racetrack where the sprinkling cart had moistened it, and they could smell hamburgers frying and see balloons aloft. They could hear sheep blatting in their pens. An enormous voice over the loudspeaker said, attention please, will the owner of a Pontiac car, license number H2439, please move your car away from the fireworks shed. Can I have some money, asked Fern. Can I too, asked Avery. I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel and it will stop at the right number, said Fern. I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another one. Can I have a balloon, asked Fern. Can I have a frozen custard and a cheeseburger and some raspberry soda pop, asked Avery. You children be quiet till we get the pig unloaded, said Mrs. Arabelle. Let's let the children go off by themselves, suggested Mr. Arabelle. The fair only comes once a year. Mr. Arabelle gave Fern two quarters and two dimes. He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. Now run along, he said, and remember, the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all the first few minutes and be back here at the truck at noontime so we can all have lunch together. And don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomachs. And if you go in those swings, said Mrs. Arabelle, you hang on tight, you hang on very tight, hear me? And don't get lost, said Mrs. Zuckerman, and don't get dirty, and don't get overheated, said their mothers. Watch out for pickpockets, cautioned their father, and don't cross the racetrack when the horses are coming, cried Mrs. Zuckerman. The children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round, toward the wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement into the wonderful midway where there would be no parents to guard them and guide them, and where they could be happy and free and do as they pleased. Mrs. Arabelle stood quietly and watched them go. Then she sighed, then she blew her nose. And here they are going off to the fair. Why'd she blow her nose? Heavy. Do you really think it's all right, she asked. Well, they've got to grow up sometime, said Mr. Arabelle, and a fair is a good place to start, I guess. While Wilbur was being unloaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, crowds gathered to watch. They stared at the sign, Zuckerman's famous pig. Wilbur stared back, and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy and it was shaded from the sun by a shed roof. Charlotte, watching her chance, scrambled out of the crate and climbed a post to the underside of the roof. Nobody noticed her. Templeton, not wishing to come out in broad daylight, stayed quietly under the straw at the bottom of the crate. Mr. Zuckerman poured some skim milk into Wilbur's trough, pitched clean straw into his pen, and then he and Mrs. Zuckerman and the Arabels walked away toward the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors. Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see a deep freeze. Lurvy wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. As soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing you can't see what I see, she said. What do you see, asked Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen and he's enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. 
Maybe he's older than I am and has had more time to grow, suggested Wilbur. Tears began to come to his eyes. I'll drop down and have a closer look, Charlotte said. Then she crawled along a beam till she was directly over the next pen. She let herself down on a drag line until she hung in the air just in front of the big pig's snout. May I have your name, she asked politely. The pig stared at her. No name, he said in a big hearty voice. Just call me uncle. Very well, uncle, replied Charlotte. What is the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? <clears throat> sure, I'm a spring pig, replied uncle. What did you think I was, a spring chicken? Ha ha, that's a good one, eh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I've heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you, and now I must be going. And here's uncle, giant pig, next to Wilbur. But just because he's big doesn't mean he's gonna win. Hopefully not. She ascended slowly and returned to Wilbur's pen. He claims he is a spring pig, reported Charlotte. And perhaps he is. One thing is certain, he has a most unattractive personality. He is too familiar, too noisy, and he cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are, nor as pleasant. I took quite a dislike to him in our brief interview. He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size and weight. But with you helping me, I'm sorry, but with me helping you, it can be done. When are you going to spin a web, asked Wilbur. This afternoon, late, if I'm not too tired, said Charlotte. The least thing tires me these days. I don't seem to have the energy I once had. My age, I guess. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather swollen and seemed listless. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple of flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said wearily, but I feel like the end of a long day. Clinging upside down to the ceiling, she settled down for a nap, leaving Wilbur very much worried. All morning, people wandered past Wilbur's pen. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him and to admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, his kind and radiant expression. Then they would move on to the next pen where the bigger pig lay. Wilbur heard several people make favorable remarks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help overhearing these remarks, and he couldn't help worrying. And now, with Charlotte not feeling well, he thought, oh dear. All morning, Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot. At noon, the Zuckermans and the Arabels returned to the pig pen. Then a few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. Avery had a balloon tied to his ear and was chewing a candied apple. The children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot, said Mrs. Arabelle. It's terribly hot, said Mrs. Zuckerman, fanning herself with an advertisement of a deep freeze. One by one, they climbed into the truck and opened lunch boxes. The sun beat down on everything. Nobody seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur, asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Not till tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy appeared carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. That's just what we need, said Avery, a blanket. Of course it is, replied Lurvy, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck so that it was like a little tent. The children sat in the shade under the blanket and felt better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. We'll read one more quick chapter. Chapter 18 is called The Cool of the Evening. In the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, Templeton crept from the crate and looked around. Wilbur lay asleep in the straw. Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. The rat was hungry and thirsty. He decided to go exploring without saying anything to anybody. <coughs> he started off. Bring me back a word, Charlotte called after him. I shall be writing tonight for the last time. The rat mumbled something to himself and disappeared into the shadows. He did not like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as a welcome relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted now. It went round and round in the sky and seemed twice as high as by day. There were lights on the midway and you could hear the crackle of the gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man in the Beano booth calling numbers. The children felt refreshed after their nap. Fern met her friend Henry Fussy and he invited her to ride with him in the Ferris wheel. He even bought a ticket for her so it didn't cost her anything. When Mrs. Arabelle happened to look up into the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher into the air and saw how happy Fern looked, she just shook her head. My, my, she said, Henry Fussy, think of that. Templeton kept out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he found a folded newspaper. Inside it were leftovers from somebody's lunch, a deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, part of a hard boiled egg, and the core of a wormy apple. The rat crawled in and ate everything. Then he tore a word out of the paper, rolled it up, and started back to Wilbur's pen. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web. At this hour, no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. 
I hope you brought a good one, Charlotte said. It is the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. What does it say, asked Charlotte. You'll have to read it for me. It says humble, replied the rat. Humble, said Charlotte. Humble has two meanings. It means not proud and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time fetching and carrying. I came to this fair to enjoy myself, not to deliver papers. You've been very helpful, Charlotte said. Run along if you want to see more of the fair. The rat grinned. I'm going to make a night of it, he said. The old sheep was right. This fair is a rat's paradise. What eating, what drinking, and everywhere good hiding and good hunting. Bye-bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte, you old schemer. This will be a night to remember in a rat's life. He vanished into the shadows. Charlotte went back to her work. It was quite dark now. In the distance, fireworks began going off, rockets scattering fiery balls into the sky. By the time the Arabelles and the Zuckermans and Lurvy returned from the grandstand, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center. Nobody noticed it in the darkness. Everyone was tired and happy. Fern and Avery climbed into the truck and lay down. They pulled the blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a forkful of fresh straw. Mr. Arabelle patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. See you tomorrow. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck and Wilbur heard the engine start and then heard the truck moving away in low speed. He would have felt lonely and homesick had Charlotte not been with him. He never felt lonely when she was near. In the distance, he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. As he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again about the dung in the dark, he begged. Not tonight, she said in a low voice, I'm too tired. Her voice didn't seem to come from her web. Where are you, asked Wilbur, I can't see you. Are you on your web? I'm back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Why aren't you on your web, asked Wilbur. You almost never leave your web. I've left it tonight, she said. Wilbur closed his eyes. Charlotte, he said after a while, do you really think Suckerman will let me live when the cold weather comes? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You're a famous pig and you're a good pig. Tomorrow you'll probably win a prize. The whole world will hear about you. Zuckerman will be proud and happy to own such a pig. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur, nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever, who knows? And now go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said, making something as usual. Is it something for me, asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte, it is something for me for a change. Please tell me what it is, begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said, when the first light comes into the sky and the sparrows stir and the cows rattle their chains, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when early cars whisper along the highway, you look up here and I'll show you something. I will show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully deep in the straw. Miles away at the Arabelle's house, the men sat around the kitchen table eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was already in bed and asleep. Mrs. Arabelle was tucking Fern into bed. Did you have a good time at the fair, she asked as she kissed her daughter. Fern nodded. I had the best time I've ever had anywhere or any time in all of my whole life. Well, said Mrs. Arabelle, isn't that nice? And we'll stop there for today. We're getting very close to the end.